Thank you, Chairman Michael, and thank you right. for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about this. I will be brief. I think you will hear uh, uh, some similarities between what uh, Dr. Atkins has just presented and myself, but I've also got a couple of other things to consider. Uh, my main message going in is that I'd like for us to be very mindful of what we've already learned in this state. And there are a lot of lessons we've already learned. We do not need to repeat a lot of what's already happened in North Carolina. And we also have a lot of good things already happening on the ground. All right. I'm going to cover four topics. Uh, the first, uh, just a reminder of what our compensation options are as a state, so we have some common vocabulary. Uh, the second and third are going to be uh, some of the learnings we have from the race to the top, which taught us quite a bit about uh, state strategic staffing, about incentive only, and also about more complex plans. And then finally, I'll end with a couple of summaries and recommendations that I think will give us plenty to talk about. I was listening to a lot of what Dr. Atkinson said, and I think that we've got some similarities there to discuss. First, the compensation. I just want to remind uh, everyone that we've got three different things we can talk about. As Dr. Atkinson pointed out with her uh, our wedding cake analogy, uh, we uh, have obviously can talk a little bit about base pay. That's not something that I'm going to discuss. I'll bring it up at the end, but I want to remind us that we have separate topics to discuss when we talk about ways to impact pay. More important for me today is what we've already learned in this state about incentive pay or pay for performance only, which is often something that comes up has been at play in the state in some places. Uh, and the difference between that and differentiated pay, which is a very broad blanket term for things that would include uh, a career ladder approaches, which we've heard some about, strategic staffing, efforts to move teachers for different, to different schools, and also rewards or bonuses for outcomes that are based on something other than just student outcomes, because we've got a larger picture here of the things that would matter for making school culture more stable and lead us to those student outcomes. First, to pay for performance, I'd just like to briefly review with you what we learned about uh, pay for performance most recently <coughs> the top, uh, because we had a couple of different uh, pay for performance uh, options at play. Uh, during Race to the Top, there was uh, an attempt to use the, the funding from Race to the Top to support uh, a bonus structure for pay for performance that reflected in large part what was available under the ABCs, but only a certain number of schools. Uh, the eligibility were the, the 118 the lowest performing schools. It was a $1,500 school-wide incentive for making high growth. That was true for the first couple of years of the program. For the third and fourth years, there was a $500 individual bonus added for teachers based on their value-added scores. This is in many ways very similar to some of the things that the state has tried in the past. Uh, what we learned from the impact of that was that for this particular program, there was very little evidence of impact on student performance. When, when the focus is on pay for performance only, and we'll follow this up with some information from studies in other states. When that's the only thing that's on the table is pay for performance, we don't see as much evidence of that having the impacts that we're looking for in terms of student performance. Most teachers that we talked to about this program, whether they were awarded the incentive or not, said that they did not feel like incentives would change their teaching behavior practices. Um, I may make better uh, records if that's what's required, but it's not gonna really change anything. We don't teach to get extra money, it's not why we do it. That may not be true across the board for all teachers in all situations, but it was a common enough sentiment that we heard that the only thing on the table was a bonus that was tied directly to student performance. That's not why they were in the job to begin with, and they were gonna be working on that anyway for the most part. Most teachers supported school-wide rather than classroom-level bonuses, and most were looking for across-the-board salary increases before there was discussion about whether or not to include differentiated pay. Now, I point these out mostly so that you have a sense of what we learned from teachers on the ground during Race to the Top, not to say whether or not we could validate their responses about whether or not they truly would perform differently with these uh, approaches. I just wanted to give you a sense of what they were saying when we were in the field. Other pay for performance studies from other states, and I provided this committee with uh, a short memo that describes uh, what the most recent research tells us about pay for performance only in a lot of other states and cities and communities. There's not very much consistent evidence that traditional pay for performance only incentives increase student outcomes. It does not seem to matter very much whether those uh, incentives are individual or team based. Uh, it does not seem to point toward much teacher behavior, changes in teacher behavior, and the incentive size also tends to not always matter. 
Now, one of the things that uh, Dr. Atkinson pointed out is that there are probably some points along the continuum of pay where you would actually see some differences if the numbers were high enough. Typically, it's hard to get to numbers that are that high, but I think that's true. I think there is a point where you would see a change based on a specifically high number. But for the most part, for most of the programs that were studied, uh, the number was not high enough to get the changes that were necessary. Now, am I bringing all of this up because I want to discourage you from, uh, from thinking about different ways to handle pay? No. What I'd like for you to do is to think about some more complex ways of handling it. I think the, the way to kick analogy is a good way of thinking of that. There are many layers we need to put, to, to, to put in place in order to make what we're talking about here actually effective in the ways that we want it to be. So we'll turn to some thoughts about strategic staffing. And strategic staffing or differentiated pay is, as I said earlier, an effort to do more than just tie uh, uh, bonus money to specifically student outcomes. It's consider a lot of other factors that might be in play in creating a school culture that's necessary for uh, uh, us to achieve the student outcomes that we'd like to see. Uh, I'm not going to read this slide to you. I didn't put it up here to read all the details. What I wanted to point out to you was one thing, though. During Race to the Top, of our 115 LEAs, 70 by our count, and we spent a lot of time going around the state checking in with different districts, at least 70 experimented with different approaches to a full strategic staffing plan that incorporated uh, aspects that focused on uh, high need schools or that focused on differentiation uh, of educator effectiveness or that focused on providing incentives for rewards other than just student outcomes. And I put some examples up there because I want to give you a sense of the scope of some of the things that these, uh, these plans covered. Like I said, I don't want to read through all of them, but I do want to point out a few of them. For instance, a focus on a high need school may be indeed to focus on those schools that have been awarded the D or the F, for instance, by the current system. But there were also some districts that experimented with focusing on schools with particularly high special needs populations. That was an important local focus for that particular district. It mattered for the local context for that school system to have the flexibility to target that particular school. Uh, for differentiation of uh, educator effectiveness, yes, some of them were based on student performance. Others of them, however, were based on things like whether or not there was evidence of, this is something that Dr. Atkinson went to as well, evidence of teachers taking on additional leadership responsibilities, and frequently it was a combination of these things in the district, not just one or the other. When we think about the incentives that were in play, yes, there were incentives for student performance, but there were also incentives for evidence of development of exemplary teaching materials, uh, of seeing uh, uh, grade school wide incentives based on grade school wide student performance relative to other schools in the district, willingness to take on leadership roles, a lot of different ways to make this happen. The state also was required as part of Race to the Top to try a statewide strategic staffing plan that would encourage teachers to move from one district to another district in the school. And the district, as Dr. Atkinson also pointed out, it's not exactly the same thing to talk about moving from Clay County to Chihuahua County as it is to talk about moving from Alamance County to Caswell County. And a lot of that has to do with the actual human costs of relocation. If I can keep my house and my family stable to change systems next door, that's a much different story than me picking up and moving across state for a teaching job. And that played out, and I think most of us kind of knew going in that this might be one of the results for this, but I wanted to point out one of the things we learned from this, that the state strategic staffing uh, under Race to the Top awarded up to, I think it was a $5,360 voucher for certain expenses if a teacher of a certain level of quality agreed to move to uh, a low-performing school. They were, they were identified in 10 districts and 30 different schools. Uh, we had uh, we had budgeted for as a state for up to 181 participating teachers that was allowable under race to the top very few teachers ended up taking this incentive and of those who did most of them were unaware of why they had received it and that's an important thing to keep in mind however i want to point back to what i mentioned earlier race to the top money uh, school improvement grant funds funds from other third-party groups were used across the state in many districts, in many ways, to develop locally sensitive thoughtful <laughs> plans about how to differentiate pay in ways that made sense for those communities. Did all of these plans work? No, they did not. But that was part of the experimentation nature of Race to the Top. Some were better than others, some were more extensive than others, some were much more elaborate than others, and the elaborate ones weren't always better. But one of the things that I wanted to make clear from this was that before we create a new system, we need to look back on the experience we've already gained from so many different experiments across the state 
you know, unfortunately, it's really hard to evaluate these under the timeline of something like Race to the Top and under the size of some of the programs. For instance, Vance County had a very elaborate plan, but Vance County is not a particularly large district, so it's hard to have the numbers and the time necessary to determine whether or not it had the impact it needed. Um, and it's not, but I also want to make clear, if you can see from the map, it's not always the big counties that came up with these plans. Uh, the difference in color, by the way, is whether or not they use race to the top funds or other funds. What matters more here is the fact is the distribution. So the example I'm pulling for you is not from Wake County, which did have uh, a plan called the Renaissance Schools Plan, or from Mecklenburg, which uh, most recently has experimented with a very elaborate plan that I think is quite good, uh, the uh, Opportunity Culture Plan, or uh, Winston-Salem, which had uh, perhaps, uh, Winston-Salem Forsyth had the most uh, complex of the plans that we observed and was, was very, uh, very well done. It was a star three and project of rich and had a couple of other names. Uh, also, the longest standing plan in the state that was pretty stable was Mission Possible at Guilford County. There were others, but I wanted to point out to you that there were also plenty of these experiments happening in smaller districts where they hadn't really had opportunities to do this before. This is a Wayne County plan, which I pulled out largely because it was pretty comprehensive. It's not particularly dynamic in that you don't see a lot of things here that are surprising. Uh, for instance, I'm a little hard time reading that screen. Let's look to it here. Um, there were individual and school level incentives, but also for, for not just student performance, but also for retention, for professional development, things like that. There was a focus on high need schools. They focused largely on getting uh, teachers to move to one particular hard to staff on a performing middle school. Uh, teacher effectiveness was differentiated um, using EBOS measures, but also using the qualitative teacher evaluation data. The incentives were available for seven days of additional professional development. Uh, and the incentive pay was more than probably Wayne County typically was able to offer. Again, I can't tell you whether or not it had the impact it needed to because it didn't last long enough and it wasn't large enough. We didn't have the time long enough to see it, but the best thing we could do was move forward on seeing what the possibilities were and what the local districts told us they wanted when they had the opportunity to make those choices for themselves. Right. In summary, I'd like to ask the committee to consider that the past should guide the future. We have plenty of experiments from districts from the state level. Let's make sure that we are looking at what we've already done, learn from those, and try to grow something that already exists before we create something new. Pay for performance is something that we need to consider, but it cannot stand alone based on what we have learned. It's an important ingredient. It's probably not something that should stand by itself. And I'd encourage you to let the districts lead the way here. Many of them have designed and experimented with these programs over the years. Many of them have been quite open about the ones that did not work. I think in particular about uh, Pitt County, which used its race to the top money to try and experiment with moving groups of teachers. It didn't work well in Pitt County. They knew that, they acknowledged it. We need to learn from the ones that didn't work as well as the ones that they said that they did. What would I recommend? Like Dr. Atkinson, I think it's important to continue to fund across the board salary increases. I think the rationale is actually related to something she mentioned too. Uh, in, in addition to me reaching regional parity, at the least I would hope that the salary increase is something that we can track to see if it will help to stem salary-based attrition. And here I'm not thinking just about attrition from the profession. But I'm thinking about attrition across our state borders now, too, because of the differentiation of pay. If I live in Caswell County, I could move to Alamance. I could also move to Pennsylvania County and teach in Danville and take a Virginia teacher's salary. The same is true if I'm in uh, Hope County, and South Carolina starts to look pretty good. At the least, an across-the-board teacher pay may help us to stem that out-of-state out attrition. I'd like to recommend that you fund multiple strategic staffing differentiated pay pilots. I know that pilots is a word that makes folks nervous because we tend to do a lot of pilots and then after three years nothing happens. I'd like to suggest that we have enough pilots in enough different districts, rural, urban, coastal, Piedmont, mountain, low performing, higher performing, so that by the end of the period, after some significant and meaningful evaluation, we can then offer to our districts a few choices for how to handle differentiating pay. It doesn't mean that it's a free-for-all with 115 different plans, but it also doesn't mean that it's a single one-size-fits-all plan. What works in Charlotte is probably not going to work in Bertie County. It may, but I think we ought to we, we owe it to our districts to give them a couple of options there. And the last but not least, this probably should be the largest goal of the presentation. And I think this is actually something that Dr. Atkinson referred to as well. We have to plan for sustainability. 
if our target for this is something that's able to last for one uh, biennium or that lasts for four years or five years, we may not see or have the opportunity to gather enough data to determine if what we're doing is really working. Five to seven years, I think, would actually be a quite generous uh, length of span to do something like this and to learn a little bit more about what's best for the state for getting the outcomes that we want. Outcomes that include student performance, but also include improvement of school culture, improvement of stability, inclusion of stability in those schools, and a look towards making sure that the schools in all of our districts are reflective of where we want to send our children. So thanks, I'll join Dr. Atkinson. Yeah.